I'm an addict. My name is Shakur. Sup? Peace and blessings. First and foremost, I want to thank Almighty God for allowing us all to be here this evening. For that, I'm, I'm truly grateful. I want to uh, thank my lovely wife, Nicole, for uh, riding down here with me and understanding that we were stuck in traffic on 295 for about an hour. Thank God for recovery. <laughs> because before recovery, if I had been stuck in traffic for an hour with, with anybody, somebody would have got put out. So I'm grateful for the 12-step process for allowing me to be okay with my wife and for her to be all right with me and, and the traffic not even be a pain. I want to thank the Cape Atlantic area <clears throat> Cape Atlantic area has been a real instrumental part of my recovery for a lot of years. I mean, I remember, man, I saw the pictures on the wall out there. I remember Barbara Blaze, who told me when I had seven months clean, you could be one of my babies. <laughs> I remember Mubashir. Mm, mm, mm. I'm just getting in touch. In, in the capital area where I'm from, we, uh, we buried uh, an addict today. She died clean. And um, when I was looking at her in that casket today and uh, thinking about coming here, Words escaped me. She looked so peaceful. She made it. She made it. She went out like she came in, clean and serene. May God grant her paradise. All right, let's get cracking. <laughs> Excuse me. Can you give me that water? Narcotics Anonymous approved literature. I don't want nobody to get up here and say, what is he reading? You know, because I have been to things before where people have read from stuff that wasn't approved. You know, they read about roads less traveled and <laughs> shit like that. And I ain't with it. This is N.A. This is Narcotics Anonymous. So if I read something, it's going to be N.A. literature. Don't let the, I don't want nobody to leave here and say, you know, he came up there and was reading from some scriptures or something. I don't know. <laughs> Spiritual, not religious program. In the 12th step, when it talks about carrying a message, it says that another time we might find it very hard to carry the message is when we're not feeling very positive about life or recovery it's, check it out, it's probably our first impulse to go to a meeting and dump all our problems out so we can purge them from our spirits. But NA meetings exist to provide a place to carry the message. Dumping our problems without tying them to recovery or trying to make it clear what the message is doesn't further the primary purpose of our groups. Look, you can come to a meeting and dump. But look, it says right here, we can carry the message even if we just point out that, look, we're having terrible problems, but we're not using over it. And why did I start off with that? It's because, I don't know, I've been to a few meetings lately where people seem to talk about everything but recovery. It seems to me that everything is more important than trying to find a new way to live. <laughs> the job is more important. The relationships. <laughs> relationships are more important. And I'm missing the message. And I realized that it's not, it's not your fault. But it's up to me 
to come in and if nothing else, maintain the atmosphere of recovery. People in my area, they want to beat, anybody with over 10 years clean, they want to beat up. They call them old timers. Now, I looked all through this book. I can't find the word old timer nowhere in here. If you can, pull me up after the meeting. I, I read it. But I ain't found the word old timer nowhere in there. I heard experienced member, but I ain't heard nothing about no old timer. Now, it's bad enough that we age in this process, and some of us don't like to get old, but you're going to beat me in the head because I got here a little bit earlier and called me an old timer. Oh, they go to the old timers. And so then they say that, like, listen, oh, the, the meetings are falling apart because the old timers aren't carrying the message. In service, it says that, look, everybody gets a chance. So every time I come in the meeting, do I have to share? Every, do I have to share? Do I have to choose the speakers? Do I have, no, I'm just, look, I'm just another addict trying to get another day clean. We only get a daily reprieve from this. Don't put that on me. Don't put that on us. I can't carry it. I'm sorry, I can't carry it. I got enough trouble getting through the day without using and killing no damn body. I'm serious. I have enough trouble getting through the day without ending up in somebody's prison or jail some damn where, not even using drugs. I got enough trouble just getting through the day trying to live by spiritual principles instead of my way. So how can you expect me to carry an entire area on my back? I can't do it. Brother came up to me, you know, <laughs> I said I wasn't going to do this, but, you know, God is in charge, so uh, it is what it is. Brother say, uh, Shakur, man, the meetings are falling apart. You know, we need you there in your spirit. We need you this. And I went to my sponsor because I was confused. I was. I went to my sponsor. I said, well, you know, the brother, they said I, 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 they need to see me more in the capital area and, and they need to see me in the more in the meetings. And my sponsor said, uh, who are you, God? When did you become God? I said, well, I'm just asking. I'm just asking because my home group is in a different area now, and, and I had to do that for my personal recovery. And then a brother, he came to me and he said, man, we, we blew life into you. Excuse me? If it wasn't for the capital area, you wouldn't, I beg your pardon. It says in the book that the reco we get the recovery from the God of all understanding. I didn't know that I, I was responsible to the area for saving my life. But maybe I am on some level. I don't, I don't know. I'm, look, I'm just another addict trying to get a day clean. But we ain't going to talk about that. We're here to rejoice in the process. I'm going to tell a story and I'm going to sit down. Check it out, right? I'm just like you. I don't care where you came from. I don't care what drugs you used. I don't care how old you are, how young you are, how rich you are, how poor you are, what you look like, what you don't look like. I'm just like you. Check it out. You know how I know I'm just like you? Because we all are here now. Look, my story is your story. Here's, here's our story. I thought that drugs were the solution to everything. This is our story. Drugs were more important to me than you fill in the blanks. This is our story. I used to live and live to use. Everything in my life was centered on ways and means to get more. This is our story. Look, look, check this out. My mother stopped becoming my mother. She no longer was my mother. She was the lady that had the pocketbook way under the bed. <laughs> my brother, my little brother, he, didn't be, he wasn't my little brother anymore. He was the kid that had a jar full of quarters in the closet. My neighbors, they weren't my neighbors. 
They were people with electronic items, television sets, and automobiles. This is our story, our shared experience. Responsibility. I'm going to come out this for a minute. This is my usher suit. I got my usher. My little kids like usher. They said, Daddy, you look like usher. <laughs> Maybe some of that money might shake loose. <laughs> Check it out. Our communities, our communities were no longer places of comfort. I come from the projects, born and raised in the projects. And when I was growing up back in uh, 19... <laughs> Fill in the blank. The projects was a nice place. Grass was cut. Everybody, well, the grass was cut. People were doing okay. But we turned it into something totally, totally different. Turned it into a place of fear. A place where people became hostages in their own houses. Afraid to come outside because of what we were doing. And it doesn't make a difference if you live there or if you came there to cop. You can't pick up one end of the broom without picking up the other. I make no distinction. We're all the same. This is our story. So I lived to use and used to live. I didn't know any other way of life. I thought, I thought there was nothing, nothing more important than getting bags and bags and bags and bags of heroin inside of my body. Nothing else was important. There was a point, because uh, I see a, a, a homie over there. I, I'm so blessed. I got a guy in here. It's a guy in here that grew up with me, right? But there was a point, and we ran together for a minute, and there was a point when we thought, we thought that our crew was the shit. We, wherever we went, everybody wanted to be with us. That's what we thought, and we lived like that. But the disease of addiction erases all illusions one more just one more that's all that became important so I lived like that for over 20 years in 19 in the beginning of 1987 I uh, found myself in uh, a treatment facility. Well, let me back up. Before that, I found myself standing in front of a judge. And the judge said, well, Mr. Towns, we got a couple options. You could get with this, or you could get with that. So me being the steadfast, do or die, ride or die kind of guy that I was, I said, well, what, what, what are my choices? And he said, you can go to jail or you can go to rehab. I thought about it for about 2.6 seconds. Rehab. I'll take the rehab, sir. <laughs> Thank you for saving my life. So they sent me to this place in Trenton, 541, and there were meetings in there. And I came in. I weighed... One, when they put me in the detox, I weighed 147. Then I took a shower, and I weighed about 135. <laughs> the identification is a mug, ain't it? <laughs> so they said, all right, after you eat, you can go downstairs. There's a meeting down there. And I said, what kind of meeting? And they said, Narcotics Anonymous. And I was like, what's that? Oh, wait, I heard of that. Yeah, okay, I'll go. So I went to this meeting. All I had was a pair of jeans, and I had this. You remember the jacket that Michael Jackson wore and beat it with the zippers in it? I had one of them. So I couldn't sell that shit. That was all I had left. I sure tried to get rid of that joint, but nobody would. Nobody want that beat it jacket. Beat it, buddy, they used to say. So, so I'm in a meeting with my Michael Jackson beater jacket on, and I'm wearing a buck 05, you know, and I'm shaking, and I'm shivering, and I'm sick. And uh, a girl who was chairing the meeting said, 
Is there anybody here for the first time? And I raised my hand, and people started clapping. And I just broke down. I had never, ever felt such an outpouring of unconditional acceptance and love in my life. And they came over and they hugged me. And they said, keep coming back. Let us love you until you can learn to love yourself. And I was, I was just humbled. And I sat in the corner and I just shook. And I knew right from there, I knew right then and there, there was something here that worked. So I stayed there for a couple of weeks, detoxing, and they sent me off up in the mountains to recover. I don't know why, why do they put treatment facilities, wait, treatment facilities and prisons, <laughs> treatment facilities and prisons way up in the mountains. I guess they figure it's hard to get dope in there, huh? <laughs> Not. <laughs> so I went to this treatment facility and it was, uh, back then they were doing 28 days, but uh, I didn't have anywhere to go. And so they kept me for like 60 days and suggested that I go to a halfway house after that. But with 60 days clean under my belt, I beg your pardon, I don't need a halfway house. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm recovered. <laughs> Send me back to the city, Jack. I got people to see. There was a girl having my baby at the time. That's what the counselor said, why do you want to go? I said, there's a girl having my baby. She, he said, well, what, what are you going to do? Do you have a degree? Do you, are you a doctor? Do you, you going to help deliver this baby? I want to be there for my daughter's birth. Yeah. So they sent me back. I remember my first day home. I went by to see my grandma. You know grandma. Grandma was something. Grandmom love you unconditionally, boy. Grandmom love you. She don't care what you do. She just love you. My grandmom just make biscuits and chicken and just hug. That's all she do. You want something to eat, baby? Come here, give me a hug. Give grandmom a hug. But grandmom had a good-ass memory. I said, grandmom, listen, I'm home. She said, God, baby, I'm so glad. I said, well, listen, can I have a key? I'm going to come and see you. She said, well, I got to go to work. I said, well, just leave a key in the mailbox. And I'll be, I'll pick it up. She said, excuse me? <laughs> See, I was living with grandma before I went away. And she had this TV, right? <laughs> yeah. And what I did, it was just me and her living in the house. But I figured if I took the TV and broke the window, she would think somebody else did that. <laughs> so she said, you can't come. You wait till I get home, baby. You only come around when grandma I'm around. And I was hurt. I was hurt. How dare you? I've been clean 60 days. Forget the fact that I've been screwing up for 20 years. I've been clean 60 days. Let me in. I did some steps when I was in rehab. I did a fourth step with a counselor. Forget one, two, and three. I did a fourth step with a counselor. The oh, fuck out of here. What is that? They told me, make a meeting and get a sponsor. So I went around to see the girl who was carrying my baby at the time. And uh, I said, well, baby, I'm home. You know, it's good to be back. I had like 30 bucks in my pocket. I felt good. I walked the street, $30 in my pocket. And everything was all right until she said, I feel good too, baby. I just cashed a check for $300. Three, three, $300. You, you got $300? You got, you got $300? And <clears throat> I was trying to convince her to give me this money because I owed it to myself to use just to treat myself good. 
She wouldn't go for it, though. So what I did was I had a meeting list, and they said, if you feel like using, call someone. Call before you fall. So I called the first name on the list, and the guy was there. And I told him I felt like using, and I didn't want to spend my money. I wanted her money, and I wanted to use. <laughs> this guy said, where are you? When I told him where I was, he said, I'm right around the corner. I'll meet you in five minutes. He met me. We walked to the barber shop. He went and got a haircut, and I didn't use. And again, I had clear evidence, clear evidence that this thing worked. But you know, the first step in Narcotics Anonymous says, until we rid ourselves of all reservations, the foundation of our program is in, in jeopardy. So I think I stayed clean another 30 days before I decided to use again. And once I started using, I couldn't stop. And it was like I had never left. That, that little bit of clean time meant nothing. It was like I had never stopped. And for the next year and a half, I was in and out, in and out. You know, you know the kind. You see him all the time. You're sitting in the home group, and oh, look, 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 here he comes again. <laughs> I wonder what he's going to share this time. And I would share that I picked up, and I was back, and I wanted to get a welcome key tag, and people said, <laughs> in my area, they was cold, Jack. <laughs> they said, I said, I got 30 days again? You got so many white key tags, you need to take them back to area service. <laughs> you know, we laugh now, but that shit hurt back then. That hurt. But I kept coming. I had a sponsor. I kept coming. And what I did was I got so tired of people talking about me using, I stopped telling you. And I would come into meetings like this. Um, through the grace of God and 12 steps of narcotics anonymous. I got 30 days a day. I'm going to keep coming. And, and addicts would tell me the most beautiful thing in the world. At the time, I couldn't hear it. They would say, keep coming. Keep coming back. Keep coming back. I hated that shit. But I kept coming back. Why am I sharing this? Because I know there's somebody here tonight that's been where I am, that's going through what I've been through. And I'm here to tell you, keep coming back. No matter what. As long as you don't die. Because I don't want you to leave here saying, Shakur says it's okay to use. No, I ain't saying that. I'm saying as long as you got breath in your body, keep coming back no matter what. Because on October 22nd, 1988, I came in a meeting, beat down, again. And I raised my hand, and I said, I'm an addict. And I'm dying. And I need help. And you told me the same thing you had been telling me all along. Listen, man, we understand. Keep coming back. Because I was arrogant. You know, you ever see people who use, then come into meetings and be mad at you? I, be, I come into meetings hot. I've, I use. You clean, I'm mad at the fellowship. And I say shit like, man, if, if y'all don't know how hard it is, you know, to stop doing this, man, then you ain't the addicts you say you are. <laughs> Keep coming back. <laughs> we love you. October 22nd, 1988, Tuesday night at the UAW Hall in Trenton, New Jersey. I went in and I raised my hand and I said, I'm an addict and I'm dying and I need help. And my sponsor was there, and he said, look, after the beating, he said, I'm going to give you a ride. He said, I, I don't know what to do for you. 
But it's obvious that you need help right now. Here's the first step. I want you to write on powerlessness and unmanageability. Because we didn't have this. We just had the basic text. And he said, I want you to read that first step every day for 30 days. Call me and make a meeting. My first day back, he didn't tell me, well, welcome back. The first year is a gift. You don't have to work any steps. Read who's an addict. Study the symbol. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, that, was, that was a little shot. I know. But my sponsor gave me the first step my first day back. October 22nd, 1988. I have not used since. You draw it up. He didn't tell me no other fancy shit. He didn't tell me. He said, you're dying. The steps of Narcotics Anonymous are our solution. They are our defense against relapse. You want to stop using? Here's the first step. Eat it. Live it. I became a first step. October 22nd, 1988. I've been clean ever since. I've been clean ever since. The main part of the first step that was hardest for me to get was that surrender piece. You know, I, I just, where I come from, you know, surrender is just not a term that we use on a regular basis. But what happened was I got clean and I started connecting the surrender with experiences in my life. I'm going to share this with you. I haven't talked about this in a while, but God has given me this today, so I'm going to run with this, right? Check it out. Let me tell you how I learned about surrender. It's funny, the things, the lessons that I learned as a child didn't really hit me till I became an adult. You know, maturity comes in stages, not in ages. So, that's some deep shit. Write that down for me. So, look, <laughs> thank you. Stages, not ages. I don't know, that's, I like that. Check it out. When I was in the sixth grade, right, Look, I grew up in the Lincoln Homes Housing Project. Lincoln Homes Housing Project in Trenton, New Jersey. We, we was tough. We, was, we used to walk around singing. We used to call us, they call us swing first. Because we, we might not win no games, or nothing, but we fight like a mother. I went to a school called Junior Five. Junior High School number five. So going into the sixth grade, sixth grade, I remember I was happy that school was about to start because that year, in the sixth grade, I was going to be the duke of my class. Anybody remember that? When you was that, that means you could beat everybody in the class. That's how we measure shit, you know. And I knew I was going to be the duke of the sixth grade because the girl who was the duke of the fifth grade had moved. <laughs> Martha had moved, so I knew coming into sixth grade that I was going to be the shit. So that summer, right before school starts, we all in the projects and we playing. We got a little uh, 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 recreate playground area there. And we see this boy. He's coming down from up the street. He don't live in the projects. He coming down to play with us. Check this out. This joker walk up in the projects with a Superman suit on. I swear he had a towel tied around his neck and a shirt his mama had painted an S on and some red shorts. He walked in the projects with that shit on. So we're looking like, who the hell is this? So he said, hey, my name is Harry. Can I play with y'all? I said, where you from? He said, I'm from down south. I said, yeah, well, you ain't down south no more. I said, yeah, you can play with us. I'll get my friends. Yeah, yeah, you can play with us. And back then, we used to play a game called Sneak 'em. <laughs> and for those of the unenlightened, that means you walk up to somebody when they're not looking and you just punch the shit out of them. <laughs> so we told Harry, yeah, we're going to play a game. Watch this. And my friend said, Shakur. So when Harry wasn't looking, I punched the shit out of him. Well, <laughs> my friend Shorty said, that Superman suit 
should have told your ass something. <laughs> Billy, I hit this boy, and the next thing I know, he grabbed me, right? And I don't know, I couldn't get away. And I felt like he was like swinging me around like this. And he was like whooping my ass. So I hollered for my friends, and he learned another, another game that day called Stomp Em. So my friends intervened, stomped his ass out, and sent him back up the street. So I didn't see Harry no more that summer. First day of school, I'm the Duke of the sixth grade. I'm walking in the sixth grade like, yeah, yeah, let me see who up in here. I'm going to take somebody lunch money. Mm -hmm, I'm going to fill a couple girls' butts. That's what we used to do in the sixth grade, fill it butts. We didn't know, we just did it. How about the first day I walk into class, who's sitting in the front row? That damn Harry. But you know, I, I, look, I'm from Swing First. We don't go out like that. So I walked up to him and I kicked him and I said three. That's how we used to do. Hold up three fingers. Three o'clock, me and you after school. So three o'clock came, I'm out there with my crew. Here come Harry, and we lock up. We get in it. I get in it. Now, a part of me wants to tell you that I whooped that boy's ass. But they say this is an honest program. So what happened was, Pretty much the same thing that had happened in the summer <laughs> happened again. Only worse this time because my friends didn't pull him off me in time. So after the, after the fight, I was walking home and my friend said, look, what you going to do? I said, what, what you going to do? Why, what you mean? You going to fight him again, ain't you? Man, you know you could beat Harry. You know you could beat Harry. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. I could beat Harry. I'm going to beat his ass. So the next day came. No, I ain't leave Harry alone. Surrender is a, it was a foreign concept to me back then. I jumped on him again. I ain't even wait till 3 o'clock. At lunchtime, I just went in his mouth. He threw me about, it threw me across about four tables in the cafeteria. <laughs> I didn't know about surrender. And after school, my friends kept telling me the same thing. You could beat Harry. <laughs> Clear evidence said the contrary. But misinformed people kept feeding me misinformation and said, you can beat this. So me and Harry fought almost every day. Let me see. September, October, November. We took a break around Christmas time. Got back into it. Let me see. January. Almost that whole school year, that whole school year, me and Harry fought almost every day. It got to be so common, people would say stuff like this. What you going to do after school? Oh, you mean uh, before or after Shakur get his ass whooped? <laughs> Hadid, I, I had a hell of a record. I was like 0 oh, and 30. <laughs> I, I, I thought, one time I had got a stick, right? And I put a stick. But I said, you know, when the shit break, I'm going to break the stick out and I'm going to get up in him. You know, it's a terrible thing when you bring a stick to a fight and they take the stick from you and whoop your ass with it. I remember the last time we fought. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was laying on the ground. looking up, and Harry was standing over top of me saying, you want some more? And I remember I said, nope. 
and, and it was like a bright light or something just shine. And I was like, I'm free. And I got up, I brushed myself off, and I started walking home. And this boy named Jeffrey was walking with me. And he said, man, you a punk. I said, what you mean? You ain't going to fight Harry no more? I said, I'm not fighting that boy no more. It has become apparently clear <laughs> that I can't win. He said, you a punk. I said, that may be true, but I'm not getting my ass beat no more. That's good enough for me. Matter of fact, I know I could whoop your ass. <laughs> I ain't going to be no more of them punks. And from that day on, I never fought Harry again. Surrender means not having to fight anymore. See, I can laugh about that shit today, but some of y'all are still fighting Harry today. Yeah, it's relationships. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's self-centeredness. It's greed. It's lust. And you can't win. It's abundantly clear you keep doing the same shit over and over and over again, wondering, asking yourself, how did I get here again? Because you won't surrender. Yeah, I can laugh about Harry whooping my ass back then, but he ain't beating me up no more. See, I ain't got no more Harrys. All you got to do is get me one time. I told this dude on the elevator, I said, man, I don't care if they was giving away dope for free. I don't care if it started raining heroin tomorrow. I'm not using because I can't win. I can't win. It's abundantly clear. 20 years, 20 years of active addiction has taught me one thing. You can't win. Surrender is the key. Surrender, that, that stumbling block when I was trying to get past that boy has now become the cornerstone of my recovery. I was talking to my wife, look, she gets mad at me sometimes because I don't argue with shit. I'm in surrender mode constantly. And I know she, she probably, she don't say it out loud, but I know under her breath she'd be probably saying, you know, you're a punk ass, you know. No, she don't say that shit out loud. No, I'm just kidding. Honey. But what I, try to, what I try to learn, what I'm trying to teach, not just her, myself, my children, the, the, the men that I come in contact with and the women that I come in contact with, is that, listen, I don't sweat the small stuff. It's not that damn important. Every battle is not meant to be won again. You know, for so long, I was so wrong. When I first got in recovery, you couldn't tell me once I get a hold of a little bit of right, oh, I'm going to beat you in the head with this. <laughs> oh, don't let me be right about nothing. And it got so screwed up, you know, I, I became so self-righteous that I thought I was right all the damn time. Today, I don't have to argue with anybody. The truth doesn't need my proof. It is what it is. And if I'm right, I'm right. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It's okay. I can admit that. On the way down here, I got into a little... So I keep talking about that. It was a long ride down here. <laughs> Thank God for the step process. I got into a little thing with my wife. And I found myself raising my voice a little bit too loud. Because what she was saying was on point. So I had to take another look. So we drove about two miles in silence. About two miles. I'm getting better, Jimmy. I'm getting quicker. We drove about two miles in silence. And I said, you know what, hon? You were right. I was wrong as hell. And I apologize. She said, okay, baby. I like it when you say that. <laughs> I just, I just want to live in peace. For so long, my life was run by chaos and turmoil. As a matter of fact, we thrived on it. We liked confusion. 
Keep them moving. Keep them guessing. They, don't, they can't watch you. I thought I was the slickest cat on the earth. There wasn't nobody I couldn't game. I couldn't hustle. I couldn't get at. Just keep confusion going on. And I could somehow get what I wanted. It was hard to give that up. Even after coming to the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous, you live a certain way for so long, it's hard to let some of those things go. Yes, I let the drugs go. Yes, I did. I let the drugs go. But the lifestyle, the manipulation. See, I always thought that either through intimidation or manipulation, I could get you to do what I wanted you to do. So just because I ain't using, I'm sharper now. I got better skills now. I can see clearly now. I got other motives. And all it brought me was pain. I don't know about you. Ah, I like to think I do. But I didn't come here to get clean to live in pain. I'm not showing up for that shit no more. I'm not volunteering to be your doormat, nor am I volunteering to be your master. Neither one of those positions are good for me today. I'm just a humble servant. I like that position, Joey. I like being a humble servant. That's what Shakur is today. Let me finish this up. Let me tell you a little bit about how good God has been, although I know I don't have to tell you. Everybody in here got their own story. You know, I can see it on your face. I can walk up to you and I can see it on your face and I know you can tell me how good God has been in your life. I'm just going to share a little bit about how good God has been in my life. When I married my wife, I had two daughters from previous Thank you. I had two daughters. She had one, and we had one together. So we had four girls. In the first house, we had uh, one, one bathroom, too. Then. So, we, so we had four daughters. Now, like I said, my wife, she had a daughter when I met her, and... Um, This girl is the light of my life, man. I mean, um, I always wanted a son. You know, you know, it's a man thing maybe. I don't know. I always wanted a son because I wanted him to be a little athlete, you know, a little ball player, you know, or a boxer or something macho, you know, so I could sit in the stands and go, that's my boy. <laughs> you know, I could ride on his shit. You know how you want to do, ride on your son's shit. That's my boy. I want to be like Wimp. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But I, I don't have any sons. But this daughter, this girl, is everything I could have asked for in a son. She's tough. She's a hell of a ball player. And I spend inordinate amounts of time and money and effort just to keep her playing ball because she loves it. And sometimes my wife gets mad because her father is not an active part of her life. And I tell her, listen, you can't be mad at him. He got the same disease I got, only his ain't arrested. And if you think he's fucked up, let me start using. <laughs> but, but I understand where my wife is coming from. She's like... Because this girl loves her daddy. The last time he came over to our house, our house, because he's welcome in my house, as long as he can act right. I ain't got no problem with that. And we gave him a, a picture of her playing in the Nationals, and they went outside. And he was showing her how to shoot baskets. I put up a little basketball court in the driveway. And he was showing her how to shoot baskets. And I saw the look on her face. She was so happy. 
that her daddy was dead. And that's okay. I can't, I can't do that. I can't take his place. I don't want to. But we have a special relationship. We went to a practice Sunday. And the coach from another team came over and he said, oh, I like the way you play. And are your parents here? <laughs> she pointed in the corner and she said, they go, my dad right there. And I said, thank you, God. What did I do? What did I do to deserve this? You know, I've been a fuck up all my life, man. I ain't been responsible for nothing. I ain't took care of nothing until I came to Narcotics Anonymous and met y'all. That's the only way I learned how to be responsible. The step process, the love, the unconditional love. Yeah, the gossip and the backbiting and all of that shit, too that y'all have given me has made me the guy that you see me today. Yeah, this, I know you talked about me. It's all right. I talked about you too, so shit. So I forgive you. So thank you. Forgive me. But all of that goes to make up the guy that you see standing here today. My wife, she, she, sometimes she's just overwhelmed. People call the house constantly, 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 constantly. I mean, just to say hello, just to do this. And I keep telling her, listen, this is what I'm a part of. This is who I am. Not only am I like this in here, but I'm like this out there too. The guy you see standing up here is the guy that you'll see going to work at 6 o'clock in the morning. Check this out. This is what I learned. I remember when I first started working, you know how when you first get in recovery and you first get a job, you want everybody to know you're recovering? You know, you come in the job and it's Monday morning and everybody's like, hey, uh, how you doing? And you're like, oh, but for the grace of God, hey, I'm here. I'm grateful to have a damn job. Thank you. What the fuck is wrong with this guy? Oh, I'm just happy to be alive. Thank you. Give me a hug. Whoa. That's how I was when I first started working, man. I was so fired up and enthused to be in recovery and to have a damn job. You know, everybody on the job knew I was recovering. I beg your pardon. I go to meet. I don't drink, buddy. Don't fucking drink. Get out of here with that. I don't drink. No, I don't do drugs. No. Matter of fact, come here. Let me show you something. I used to walk around with a basic text in my pocket and shit. Twelve steps, damn it. That was 18 years ago. Check this out. I work in a, in a fairly big organization today. And maybe out of the 200 employees there, maybe two or three of them know that I'm in recovery. The rest of them just think I'm a hell of a guy. They, they've written newspaper articles. I talked to a lady from 60 Minutes about the work that we do. Because what I do on my job, I learn to do in here. You know, I work with a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, clinicians which I'm one too, but you know, and then they study and they read and they write papers and all of that. But I got my training sitting on the front row here. And we go to training sessions to learn how to have empathy for the people we serve. Ain't that a bitch? I learned that on the front row, right here. I learned to feel what you're feeling right here because you felt what I felt right here. So on my job, they just think I'm a hell of a guy. Oh, what a great employee that guy is. Boy, he shows up, he does this, he does that. And I just say to myself, if you only knew. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm blessed to, to work in the, uh, within, with people in the criminal justice system. And my boss, the, the clinical director, she's always saying, how do you know so much about prison? <laughs> now, 
check this out. The first day we got this contract to work in the jails, right? I had four people working for me. And um, so we all had to fill out these forms to go into the prison. So when they came back, the, my, my director, she said, well, everybody's clearance came back okay. And I said, great. And she said, except one person get, didn't get cleared. I said, now who the hell didn't get cleared? How dare them not tell me? They all told me they could pass a check. And they, she said, it was yours. I was like, oh, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> I'll clear that up. Just a little misunderstanding. She's always saying, how do you know so much about the prison? I read a lot. <laughs> I, I just, and the reason why I say that is just, it, it's not even necessary for them to know what I do and who I am. Because what I do and who I am makes up the employee that they have today. And all they need to know is they paying me for doing the damn job. And that's it. I don't have to beat anybody in the head with my recovery anymore. I don't have to prove to anybody that I'm recovering today. I'm clean. I know that. God knows that. You know that. That's enough for me. So listen, I want to, uh, again, thank Almighty God for allowing us all to be here and enjoy and experience this recovery. I, um, I owe a lot to the Cape Atlantic area. And uh, I owe a lot to Narcotics Anonymous. I don't think, I don't care how long I live, I don't think I'll ever be able to balance the scales out for what y'all have done for me. You made me the person that I am today. You allowed me to open up enough to see the beauty of life. You loved me so much, you allowed me to feel God's unconditional love. Not only do I feel it, but I express it today. We were listening to this song on the radio. This boy say, uh, I don't care if you gain a little weight. What did he say, baby? I don't care. Some, yeah, when your hair turns gray, I love you. I, say, I still want you if you gain a little weight. Yeah, yeah, see, that's, oh, that's what I'm talking about. So, so we riding, and the, the song was playing, and I told my, I said, that boy is deep. That's a deep piece right there. So my wife said, what you talking about? I said, that's real unconditional love, because I'm not going to kick you to the curb if you lose your job, if you gain a little weight, if you break your leg, if you go blind, if you get shot, you know, if you get gray hair, if all your motherfucking hair fall out, you know what I'm saying? If you lose that, that nice ass that I like, if you lose, I ain't, I ain't, you know what? Because this is unconditional. God taught me how to do this. And he blessed me with you, so how could I not return the favor? I'm an addict. My name is Shakur. Thank you. <laughs>